It's interesting, you know, as we were, as I was kind of getting ready and, and preparing this message, I was, I was caught up with thinking about how much of our days and how much of our lives are spent with a call, waiting on a call, right? Perhaps uh, some of you can think back to a time when maybe you were a kid, you're in the playground and you're waiting to see if maybe your name's going to be called to be on that certain team. Right, and so you're waiting, you're waiting, or or you fast forward a little bit, and you find yourself waiting on a call from a college that you apply to, or maybe a team that you're hoping to play for one day as well. And then also, uh, maybe you can think to the time when you were dating that special someone, and you're waiting to hear back from them on a phone call. You're waiting by your phone, maybe a text or something like that. Or grandparents, how about the times when you were waiting to hear from that son or daughter announcing a pregnancy or the, the gender of that future grandchild of whom you were so excited to meet? You know, so much of our lives are spent waiting on a call. And what's interesting is that oftentimes these calls can very easily turn from a call into a calling. You know, that call that you're waiting for by that significant other can turn into the calling to be a husband or a wife or the call from the son or daughter can turn into the calling to be a grandparent. And frequently these calls that turn into callings, they come in pivotal moments in our lives, don't they? And when we're waiting especially, though, on a call from God, we can find ourselves with a lot of questions that come along with that. And as we're waiting on that call, certainly it can and should lead to a pivotal moment in which everything changes. And as we're waiting on that call, a lot of questions come. What does that divine calling look like? Who is it for? And is it possible perhaps even to miss it? Surely we've all felt that knot in our stomach of like, oh my goodness, maybe, what if I've missed the calling that God's placed on my life? Well, the passage that we're going to look at this morning is going to answer some of these questions for us as we're going to kind of seek to understand how the calling of Jesus will lead us from a condition and into a commission. So if you would, join me in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It says this, As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Ma Master, Simon replied, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's sons, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the many callings that you have placed on the people that are within this room. But I pray specifically, God, that as we study your word this morning, you would make it abundantly clear the calling that you've placed on our lives for your kingdom. I pray as we study your word, God, that we would submit ourselves to it. We would be vulnerable enough to allow you to speak to us, to examine us, to convict us of maybe sin that's present within our lives, or to challenge us in ways that maybe we've become negligent. But above all, God, I, I think I can say this in behalf of everyone who's gathered here this morning. We pray that you would be glorified this morning through the study of your word and the singing of praise. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> so the first thing I want us to take a look at this morning as we're studying this passage, is the calling of Jesus. Because I think it's very important, and, and we're going to see some pretty key aspects behind this passage. And, and first of that being how the calling that Christ offers is a general calling. Look at verse 1. It says, As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's 
word. He was standing by Lake Gennesaret. Now that's a very, that's just another way of saying the Sea of Galilee. But it says that the crowds had gathered to hear God's word. And you know, it's interesting that I, I feel like if we're all being honest, we all want to hear a word from God. Even if you're here this morning and maybe you're not a believer, maybe this is your first time here and you're just checking things out and someone drug you here after you've recovered from your turkey coma. I think that we can all agree, though, that to some extent, people want to hear a word from God. You did not come here this morning to hear from Andre. You did not come this morning to hear from me. You came to hear from God. And in fact, it wasn't that long ago that stadiums would be packed with people who wanted to hear Billy Graham preach. And so that, I think that longing that people have to hear from God is still there. But why is that? Is it, is it because of a a craving or a sense of loneliness or is it just blind interest you know i'm just i'm bored you know i want to see if if there's something to some of this religious stuff well i think that it ultimately comes down to a fact that every single person that has ever lived has within themselves an innate desire to know god to hear from him cs lewis wrote this phrase and he says that if I find, if, or if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. And as Christians, we know that to be true because we recognize that we were created in the image of God. And as he placed his stamp upon us, it means that we were not only made in his image, but we were made for him. As human beings, we were created and designed with certain capacities and freedoms, but ultimately those things were placed within us so that we might seek God and know him. The chief end of man, man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Or as Augustine of Hippo said, you made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. But one of the beautiful aspects about the general calling that God has placed to everyone to hear his voice, to draw near to him, is that God has also offered a specific calling. Look at verse 3 within the passage here. It says that Jesus got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. Then he sat down and was teaching the crowds from the boat. Now, Peter had been fishing all night. The last thing that was on his mind was having an encounter with God that morning. The last thing that he was thinking about was, hmm, maybe God's going to you know, use this night of nothing for his glory or for, or for my good. He's just minding his own business. And coincidentally, in his eyes, he suddenly finds within his boat the Son of God. Now, he doesn't recognize him as such just yet. But I imagine that there is likely some of you here this morning who just find yourself here by coincidence. You weren't seeking God. You weren't maybe expecting to find him or, or hear from him. But like Peter in this passage, what I want you to know is that God very well has you in his sights. He's pursuing you. He's seeking you. And just as much as he offered a general calling to all who might listen, he is looking for you specifically to see whether or not you are going to answer his call. And as Peter finds himself in a boat with Jesus, we see in Jesus the, a glorious depiction of the kind of God that we serve, of him being the good shepherd, the one who leaves behind the 99 and pursues the one. He's got a whole crowd of people who have come out to listen to him, but he's worried about this probably smelly fisherman who's more than likely in a pretty sour mood after not catching anything. Those of you who fish, you, you probably really to what it's like to spend a whole day on the water and not catch anything. Or maybe just for the rest of us, we know what it's like to stay up all night working on something and then the next morning have nothing to show for it. We're typically not in a good mood, right? And so then Jesus begins to address this man and he says in verse 4, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now it's a little bit ironic here that the carpenter is trying to tell the fisherman how to do his job. You know, Peter's probably like, you know, listen, teacher, you, great speech, enjoyed the message. This is, my, this is my stuff. 
I, you, let me worry about the fishing. I'll let you worry about the carpentry and the teaching. And, and I'm sure that many of you can probably relate to maybe how Peter felt within his own heart. Uh, those of you with teenagers, right? Probably Peter's looking to Jesus in this moment the same way that a teenager looks to their parent when their parent's trying to explain to them technology, right? They're like, okay, yeah, thank you. Oh, turn it off and turn it back on. Um, or, or maybe it's, or it's this, the mom who has her kid and she's getting parenting advice from the person who doesn't even have any children. Or the business owner who's getting stock advice from the college student, right? And, and, and so there's this feeling of you don't know what you're talking about. Let me worry about the thing that I'm good at. But the difference within this story is that Peter's not just dealing with the carpenter. He's dealing with the creator. He's dealing with the very one who not only knows more about fishing than he does, but knows him better than he knows himself, which makes him utterly trustworthy, utterly worthy of trust and respect and of honor. And so there's no need to doubt his commands, no matter how strange or contradictory. And as Jesus asks Peter in verse 4 to put out his boat a little bit further, Peter finds himself in a pretty unique situation as to whether or not he's going to obey or he's going to disobey. And his decision is really setting up for himself a lot of opportunities for blessing in his life or not. I had the privilege last week while I was visiting Emily's family in Kansas to sit under uh, her pastor back in Hillsboro, Kansas. His name is Jeremy. And luckily for me, he was preaching on the exact same passage that I'm preaching this morning. And as I was listening, I was thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I'll get to hear something. And he told this story that I thought was so fitting for what we're studying here. And he talked about how when he was a kid, he had two other brothers. And one day, he and his brothers got dropped off from school, back home. And as they're walking up to the door, they find a note taped to the front of the door. Maybe it's a post-it note or something like that. And it just says, feed the cat. Now, immediately, the boys get upset. Because as they, they're like, all right, feed the cat, the door's locked, and they can't get in. They don't know where their parents are. They don't know how long they're going to be gone. They don't know when they're going to be coming back. And suddenly, they find themselves with just the command of feed the cat. And they begin to talk amongst themselves. They get really upset, really frustrated. How could our parents care more about this dumb animal than about their own sons? It's a busy street. It's not a very safe neighborhood. We're locked out, and they're worried about the cat, about feeding the cat. And so they stew on the front porch. They're waiting. They're mad. They're putting together the argument that they're going to lay out to their dad when he gets home. And finally, he does pull into the driveway. And so the brothers assemble themselves with the oldest taking the stand as chief prosecutor. And as the dad mounts the steps, they lay into him. How could you do this? Don't you care about us? We've been waiting out here. It's cold. Didn't you, didn't you worry about us, your sons, and not this cat or whatever? And as you guys can, can likely guess, what was the question that the dad asked the boys? Did you feed the cat? And they just about blow a gasket. They're so mad. And he goes, follow me. They walk around the house, and they find where they, where they feed the cat, and in the bottom of the food bowl is the house key taped to it. You see, the dad was wise because he knew, A, if he just leaves the house unlocked, parents, you know how kids are. They're not going to see the note. They're going to forget. They're not going to do it. Uh, and at the same time, he can't leave such a detailed note on the door that details how long they're going to be gone, when they're going to be back, because what if somebody else sees that? And recognizes that the kids are home alone. And so rather than follow through with obedience to their father's command, where they could have had the opportunity to have an entire afternoon spent in safety, security, shelter, a stocked pantry, and video games, they decided to disobey and missed out on the blessing of their father. Now, in the same way, Peter is finding himself in kind of a somewhat of a feed the cat moment here as to whether or not he's going to listen to this strange command by this strange man. But I could probably warrant to guess that many of you likely find yourselves, maybe even right now, in a feed the cat moment. How many of you have found yourself being prompted by God in some way to follow through with a command that just makes absolutely zero sense? What do you mean I should have a conversation with that person? They're not going to listen. You want me to do what with my bonus? 
You know how long I worked and how hard I worked for that and how helpful that will be for us? You want me to go to another country where it's not safe in order to spend my time building a a church or a building or something like that? We find ourselves frequently faced with these moments where God is calling us out into deeper water and he's waiting to see whether or not we're going to be obedient. Because more often than not, should we follow through with obedience, we're going to find ourselves with such blessings and promises and joys than something we could never expect. And so Peter, thankfully, in this passage is obedient. And we see in verse 5, he says, Master, we've worked hard all night long and caught nothing, but if you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they did this, They caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And then we find second here what's really important for us to understand, and that's the condition of man. Because in light of the miracle that Peter just witnessed, he suddenly becomes realizing... He comes to a point of realization of exactly who he is and who it is that's before him. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me because I'm a sinful man, Lord. He says, Go away from me. And when we observe the words of Peter, we hear really a pattern of Scripture that we have witnessed throughout the Bible. Isaiah, in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, finds himself before the glory of the Lord. And he's absolutely shocked and horrified at what he sees. And he says, woe is me because I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And in the midst of holiness, he wants to pull back. Same with Israel. Before the mountain of the Lord, when God had descended and covered the top of a mountain with a cloud of thunder and fire and lightning and trumpets, what did the people of Israel do? They pulled back and they said, Moses, you go. We, we don't want to be anywhere near that. Or certainly we can think to the very beginning of the Bible when Adam and Eve sinned. And what did they do? They hid from God. They pulled back. Because they became aware that they were naked, that they had sinned, and they sought to hide from God. And what's very interesting about Peter's words is they're certainly understandable, but I think that they can be taken in different ways. Peter's word in verse 6, or actually in verse 8, he says, Go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. Now, there's a way that you can respond in recognition of this passage of the condition of man as arrogance. There's a way to interpret these words and respond to God and mean them literally. Because oftentimes, if, you know, if we find ourselves caught up in a sin that really just, it's pretty good. We like it. We enjoy the things that we're doing that we know that God probably wouldn't be too pleased with. It feels good. Tastes good. We enjoy the people that we get to be around as we do it. And if we're not careful... In the way that we live our lives, we could very easily be saying Peter's words, but mean them literally in, depart from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman, and I like it. I'm enjoying it. I don't want to hear what you have to say right now. And then my prayer is, is for you, if that's you this morning, at least that you would, you would recognize the precarious situation and position you've put yourself in, and you would turn away from that kind of living because you have no idea how much more time God's going to give you, how much more time He's going to be patient with you. And rather than having an arrogant condition, you would instead have a humble condition because Peter's words are coming from a place of humility. And I recognize that there are others of you who are here this morning And you would agree with Peter. You would say, yeah, depart from me, God, because I'm a sinful man. I'm a sinful woman. And maybe you find yourself just really weighed down with the regret of past mistakes. Maybe you just feel really weighed down that, man, you've got a marriage that failed and you're filled with regret over that. Or there's a child that you wish that you had parented better. Or there's a secret addiction that you're nursing. Or or you're just you're super, you know, caught up and dealing and struggling with anxiety. 
And, and with all of that, we find ourselves that, you know, we're, we're afraid that God doesn't want to be near us. And you see, the problem is, is that oftentimes the sin that we're battling will give us a warped view of holiness. In that we think that because God is holy, he wants nothing to do with us. And so we pull back. And we hide. When in reality, what a right view of holiness should lead us to do is to draw near. Because you see, holiness is by no means afraid of unholiness. God is known as Emmanuel, right? God with us. He came, he dwelt among us, he lived a life with us. And he wants to be near us. But our sin has made us think that for some reason God wants nothing to do with the unholy when in fact in God's holiness he pursues us. Holiness does not back away from unholiness, it pursues it. As light seeks to fill dark spaces, so does God's holiness seek to pursue you and to find you in your regret, in your sin, in your shame, in your frustrations. So that you might have an encounter with God. That you might know that he loves you and that he has a purpose for you and a calling to place on your life. And so rather what we should be doing is revising Peter's prayer and say, draw near to me, Lord, because I am a sinful man. I am a sinful woman. I need you, Lord. Will you cry out in desperation to God, recognizing your sinful condition, or are you going to pull back in despair? Because the third thing you need to see here is that no sooner does, does Peter have a recognition of his condition that Jesus offers him a commission. Look at verse 10. The second half of verse 10 says this, Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Jesus' words are kind of interesting. As Peter says, depart from me, Jesus says, don't be afraid. Fear is dismissed in this commission. And what's, what we need to kind of keep in mind here is what Jesus doesn't say in light of Peter's confession of his own sin. He doesn't say, it's okay. I know it. I know you're doing your best. It's okay. You've been trying really hard. Don't worry about it. No big deal. No, when Jesus says, don't be afraid. He is, in a way, acknowledging that, yeah, what Peter said was true. He is a sinful man. He is sinful. But Jesus is wanting to draw near to him. And on, honestly, you guys, there's times when we need to be honest with ourselves. And I think most of you would agree with me that typically we would far prefer honesty than kindness when it comes to the examination of the condition that we're in. It does no good for someone who's broken their arm to go to the doctor and the doctor looking and be like, yeah, you're all right. Rub some dirt on it. You'll be okay. Bye-bye. No, we want to hear how bad it is. We want, when we are faced with the reality of our condition, it is actually in a way kind of assuring because then we're able to know what, it is, what is going to be required to address it. When we, are made away, when we are made aware of our condition, we are then able to rightly address the problem. And in the same way, when we come to God with our sinfulness and our brokenness, God looks at us and honestly says, you're right. You are sinful. You are broken. But don't be afraid. Because I'm here. No sooner that fear is dismissed, favor is delivered. Jesus does speak truly when he says, don't be afraid. Because he's saying, I accept your repentance. And I'm going to change you. I will move you from a sinful condition. And I'm going to give you a sacred commission. And Paul, Peter, right here, Peter gets a career change. Something that he never expected. And suddenly, the object lesson within the passage becomes clear. Because Peter is going to become a fisher of men. A fisher, a fisher of people. Because no sooner did, did he witness all these things, that he will soon be himself fishing for people within the depths of their sins. So that he might cast out the net of the gospel and draw them into the boats of the church. So that they might be freed and saved from the wrath of God. But don't be so foolish as to think that that commission 
ended with Peter. It's been extended to you. It's been extended to me. We are a part of the same calling. The same calling that God has placed upon Peter's life. He's given to us. Certainly we won't be apostles. But we certainly can engage in fishing for people. Because he has a heart for the brokenhearted. Does he not? God is sending Peter out. Just as he pursued Peter, he says, hey, I want you to go pursue people too. I want you to go to the people in the depths of their sins. I want you to pursue them. I want you to find them. I want you to bring them into my love and to my hope and show them how much I love them and care for them and that I'm with them and I won't leave them because no sooner should we recognize that fear is dismissed, favor is delivered. But here's the other thing, you guys. Faithfulness is demanded. Faithfulness is demanded. Look at verse 11. Jesus says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching people. And then verse 11, then they brought the boats to land, left everything, and followed him. They left everything. Isn't that strange? They've been fishing all night. And now they just had this miracle that caught so much fish that two boats were starting to sink. And now they're going to leave the net behind to follow Jesus? How, what's going on there? I mean, are they being irresponsible? Do they not, are they not thankful that Jesus just provided this, this incredible blessing? Obviously not. And the reason for that is because when faced with the incredible material blessing that they had just been given, the creation, the blessing of creation that had just been laid at the feet of Peter and James and John, they recognized that the one who had delivered the blessing was worth far more value than the net of fish. And they say, forget that. I want him. Because they saw that not only was he worthy of praise and honor, but he gave them a blessing of something they really were seeking. And in that, won their trust. That Jesus really did care about them. That he really was concerned for them. So he blessed them materially with a net full of fish. But they recognized that if they were to follow him, they were going to have to leave it all behind. But how many of you are still trying to follow Jesus while dragging that net of material possessions, of money, of safety, of security, of relationships and thinking that you can still follow the creator while hanging on to the creation. Faithfulness is demanded in this commission. And the faithfulness comes in the realization that Jesus, that God, and the things that he's blessed, that, that who God is is worth far more than anything he could ever give us. Because ultimately we recognize that he's given us himself He's given us his son. And as we think about, you know, how we're to live a life that reflects a commitment, a sold out commitment to the commission that God has placed upon us to live on mission for him. I was, I was, I found myself trying to think about, you know, who, who maybe, who's a good example of, of living a life like this? And I was drawn to a guy by the name of William Borden. Now, maybe some of you have, have heard about Borden before, and I think uh, students, I, I may have mentioned about him on a Wednesday night once, but William Borden was born in 1887, and he was born to an incredibly wealthy family. They were millionaires. And he, upon graduation from high school, was given the incredible opportunity to experience a gap year. And so his parents allowed him to travel the world with a missionary, and he got to go all over the world from Rome to Japan and really see, well, the, the world. And he's been given this opportunity and promise of a life of luxury. He'll be the inheritor of all the wealth and, and material possessions that his family had. But as he traveled the, the world, he wrote in his journal, I've never thought very seriously about being a missionary. But when I look ahead a few years, it seems as though the only thing to do is to prepare for the foreign field. His father cautioned him against making any kind of significant decisions until he was at least 21, which, you know, is good advice. But another friend also told him, hey, don't throw away your life so flippantly. 
But nonetheless, Borden wrote within his Bible, no reserves. He returned to the States and began to attend college at Yale University. And he immediately began to apply to serve with the China Inland Mission. And he would also repeatedly be rejected. And he would keep applying, keep applying. Ultimately, they would accept him, but it wouldn't be until after he had graduated college and after he had graduated Princeton Theological Seminary. But in the meantime, he recognized that God had placed a calling on his life to make the most of it that he could in spreading his kingdom because a calling is not contingent upon a location but on opportunity. So he got to work on the campus of Yale. And in his freshman year, he began to organize Bible studies for the people on campus. And by the end of the year, he had 150 students attending a weekly Bible study. By the time he graduated as a senior, that number had grown to 1,000. And also during that period, he recognized the need of the homeless and the men who were struggling within the town and surrounding area. And so he established a rescue mission. And in a single year, over 14,000 people had heard the gospel 17,000 people had received a warm meal, and 8,000 had found a place to sleep. A visiting British theologian was asked what he found most impressive about America, and he said, the sight of that young millionaire kneeling in prayer beside a bum at the Yale Hope Mission. Eventually, Borden would leave it all to go serve overseas after his father died. And when he did so, a Chicago newspaper's headline read, Millionaire gives up all. But in Borden's Bible was written, no retreat. He eventually found himself on a boat to Cairo, Egypt. And as he landed, he immediately began to share the gospel and try to do ministry. And within three months, he would die from spinal meningitis. A life cut so short. And it's easy for us to look at that and to think about what a waste. He could have done so much here. He was a brilliant mind. Maybe he could have helped with some of the theological liberalism that was infiltrating Princeton at that time and maybe stood as a bulwark for the academics there because he was incredibly bright. Maybe he could have continued to serve with the Yale Rescue Mission or, or with the Bible studies there on campus. And it's so easy for us to think about, man, he could have done so much more. But I think if we're being honest and we look at a life like that and if we really ask ourselves, was it wasted? We'd say absolutely not. And within his Bible was also written the final phrase, no regrets. Now, there's been some debate by scholars as to whether or not he ever actually wrote those words in his Bible because scholars haven't been able to find him writing no reserve, no retreat, no regret. But even if we can't find those words written explicitly in his Bible, I think we can all agree that it's written implicitly on his life. And I, I don't know about you, but I want to live a life like that. That I can look back and I can be satisfied and content with the way that I lived. That yeah, I lived with no reserve, no retreat, and no regret. And I look out to a room filled with people uh, it's, it's a room filled with tired moms, maybe stressed out business owners, anxious teenage girls, insecure high school boys. And it's easy to observe a life like William Borden and think, I am never going to inherit millions. I'm never going to find myself establishing a rescue mission. And I certainly probably won't be on a boat to Cairo, Egypt. That's a very inspirational story, but what does that mean for me? Here's the thing, you guys. The way that you can start living a life like that is today. You start with today. You start with today living a life of no regret, no retreat, no reserve. You come to God recognizing your sinful condition and that I need the Lord. You quit running from him. You quit hiding from him. You quit nursing those pet sins. You quit acting like everything's okay. And you bring it before him and you lay it down and you say, draw near to me, God, because I am a sinful man, because I'm a sinful woman. And for some of you, today means that you need to start that relationship today. For others, you need to today make the decision that I'm gonna turn away from these sins, but I need prayer if I'm gonna do this because I can't do it on my own. Or maybe there's some of you who realize that God is leading you to a point where you need to be on a sold out 
lifestyle for him where you write a blank check with your life and you slide it across the table and you say, God, fill it in as you want. I'm yours. I remember whenever I was... uh, when I was in high school, there would be altar calls all the time for men and women who felt that God was calling them into ministry. And you don't encounter those too much anymore, and it's getting alarming because there's more people right now in ministry above the age of 65 than there are those beneath it. And I, I, I can't help but wonder if maybe there's even some people here who might even be feeling that God has been leading and calling them into a life of ministry. So here in just a moment, We're going to have an opportunity to respond. I'm going to be down here. There's going to be an elder over here. And my challenge for you you this morning is to just focus on today. What is it today that God is calling you to do as a mom, as a dad, as a single man or a single woman, as a college student, as a high school student, as a middle schooler? What is it today that he wants you to do? And are you going to be obedient? Are you going to respond to the call or are you going to reject it? I hope it's not the latter. And so we ask, and I'm going to ask you to just respond how the Lord might be leading you and focusing on just making that decision today because ultimately today's turn into yesterday's. And yesterday's turn into weeks, weeks into months, months into years, and suddenly you're looking back on a life that was just poured out for the kingdom of God or a life of healing where God took your brokenness and your sin and he made you whole. And so however the Lord might lead you this morning, we ask just that you respond in obedience. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for the truth of the gospel. I thank you, Lord, for the calling that you've given us. God, no sooner did you utter the words, don't fear, that you were telling us to go out and fish for more people. In the same breath that you forgave our sins, you commissioned us to go spread the good news to other people. And God, I pray that we would not lose track of that, that we would leave behind the things of this world, that we would quit dragging the nets of money and of concerns and resources and and a hunger for safety and God we would just live our lives sold out for you commissioned for you pursuing you God Jesus I pray I pray there might be one person even in here this morning that recognized they've been running from God for a long time or maybe that they had no idea that they would encounter God this morning. And though they may not have been pursuing you, you were pursuing them the whole time. And God, I pray that they would begin that relationship this morning. Lord, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would move amongst your people this morning as we respond to your word. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.